Hello, Culture Matters Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to introduce you to our guest. Before I do that, here's a quote I think is perfect for this episode we can unpack. We often contradict an opinion for no other reason than that we do not like the tone in which it is expressed. Friedrich Nietzsche. See, we believe here at Culture Matters, when people read to think, write to develop, listen to hear what is unsaid and speak to let go, they develop more value for themselves and others. So our purpose of this podcast is to uncover the genius of our guest with the goal to make you, the listener, your curiosity cool. Because our vision is that human culture is open, curious, and focused on creating the future. So our mission is to read, write, listen, and speak every single day. I want to laugh right now. Jeremy's laughing. He's loving this. Thank you so much, Jeremy Adams, for coming. And let me do the introduction before I have too much fun here. Jeremy and I go back almost five years. We met at a conference, both speakers, myself, my fiance, Jen, are blown away by his certainty, his confidence, and his confidence that was clearly articulated from the stage. And we've been friends ever since. Jeremy, one of the original founders of Founders. You can look it up, check it out an OG in business, done business with people like, you know, the original shark, Kevin Harrington. He's an advisor, a strategist, partner with Max Finn. If you've seen him on TikTok, TikTok influencers, he's another brilliant man, their partners, and they've got unicorn innovations, unicorn um, traffic, essentially people that you see online that are likely speaking to you in certain ways that's resonating with you. People like Jeremy and the partners that he has are behind those people, right? Uh, the, the, the influencers behind the influencers. There's more that I want to say. I, I want to make this the best introduction that I've ever made. But I, but really now, um, I, I should just ask uh, my friend how he's doing. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, of course. Oh, I, I forgot one more thing. Openly out, <laughs> Openly outspoken podcast. A lot of great episodes. If you're listening to this, subscribe to that podcast. A lot of gold on there. Very authentic show. And check out episode 91 of the Culture Matters podcast, season eight, because Jeremy has been on this show before. So if you like Jeremy, you can listen to that again. And now, sorry. No, I was just going to say I appreciate you introing me with my uh, least profitable and least successful business venture to start. You know, <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, uh, the podcast, I committed to doing an episode a week for a year and open and I did that and openly outspoken was really I just wanted to exercise my First Amendment right to talk about whatever I wanted and then just have people on there that I thought I was going to disagree with and us have cordial debates, but um, not all the time would we disagree. I probably debated with you more than people I thought I was actually going to disagree with. It was a good learning lesson to just realize that we're not as different as maybe uh, the media or what our brains would even tell ourselves because we were able to talk and come to some common ground on like tons of different topics. I mean, you, you've listened to some of the episodes. We've talked about everything under the sun, uh, Scientology, abortion, uh, racism. I mean, every controversial topic I could come up with, we had an episode <laughs> about. Uh, um, we didn't go in euthanasia. Maybe I should do break out the podcast again and, and do that one. But we that was the whole point is like, there's conversations that need to be had. Let's find people with altering views and discuss it. And that ended up being really productive overall. So what did you learn about yourself doing that? That I could potentially be a great politician one day because I, I feel when I put the effort in, I'm really good at talking to all different types of people mm -hmm. with different viewpoints. It It is a lot of work to do that. Um, not that they're they're bad people and stuff, you know, it's just different, you know, not that one is better or worse or right or wrong, but um, people know in their life, they can think of friends or relationships they have where 
it's just easy and effortless. I think you and me have always had that. I describe a relationship, although we have debates commonly, the relationship is effortless. Would you agree? Yeah, that's an endearing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That's, that's typically what I look for in close relationships in my life. Like, is this relationship a lot of work? When you're talking to people of all different beliefs, backgrounds, I mean, religions, viewpoints on strong subjects. I mean, it's, I wouldn't define it as effortless. There's definitely some effort and patience that has to go into it. Um, but it's a good test of your uh, discipline and self-restraint and commitment to trying to understand other points of view. So yeah, I'm, uh, it was a challenge for me. I did it. Uh, at some point, I do want to start creating more content. Um, just right now, I just had my head down and this is like the first recording of any kind I've probably done in like a year. Is there a level of angst that comes with having stepped away from that and then being a part of it? And I ask because I, I well, selfishly, I want to know because I'm going through that in my own way in another medium. So that's that's the first question is, is there any angst having stepped away and then coming back? Not really. It was just a conscious decision for me. Within a three to six months period, I decided to remove a lot of projects from my life professionally and personally to get more focused and get more aligned with what I'm looking to accomplish. And uh, the podcast was just one of the casualties. Um, that is something that, whether it's that podcast, which I had a lot of passion in, um, having a uncomfortable adult conversations, I think is something I enjoy um, doing. So there's a possibility that Openly Outspoken is relaunched. But yeah, I mean, just, it's a lot of work. I mean, you know, booking guests and uh, last minute cancellations and uh, doing research prior to the, you know, it's like a starting another side business, basically. So I just decided uh, it wasn't the most crucial thing in my life at the moment. And to put that one on, on pause. How important in your view is it to be able to take things off the plate when one is actually owns a business or businesses and is heading towards a certain direction? How important is it to be able to do that? Yeah, I mean, we're in a weird, uh, you and me talk about this all the time. We're in a weird phase of, as we're recording this in March of 2023, of just the entrepreneur bubble um you hear all these things you need seven streams of income the average millionaire is seven streams of income which is really misleading because if you think about it that could be like earning money from your savings account dividends from stocks i mean like <laughs> there's like it's very misleading seven streams of income like uh you know parents uh ubering on the weekend i mean i don't even know what that means but <laughs> I why do I find that so funny? I don't know. Well, because we just hear it so much, and the people that I look up most to in business, they're typically involved in a lot of projects, maybe more on an investor advisor level. But a common theme of a lot of them was they had their main foundational business, like they had their. Mm if you think about like a tree trunk with branches, like all these side like investments and stuff are like the branches, but they need that foundation for uh, financial stability, ultimately, uh, cash flow growth. Um, and I was focusing on the branches more than I was focusing on watering the foundation, right? Do you think that happens without us entrepreneurs even realizing it? For sure, because uh, one thing that makes, at least me, one thing that I, I think is a, it's a blessing and a curse, but mostly a blessing to get to the point, it's only a curse once you've taken on too many opportunities, is we have the cliche shiny object syndrome. And I think we have that because mm. the excitement of something new, like to problem solve and strategize and starting a new project is exciting. You know, it's kind of boring to water. I keep making these silly analogies, but like, or metaphor, like 
watering these plants rather than like building the greenhouse. Like building the greenhouse is fun. When you, my businesses now, I just have a calendar reminder every day. It's like, how can I support my business partners and my team? Like focusing my energy on investing inward, not new projects. Mm. And it, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge, you know, because my brain's always like new and exciting, new industry, new learnings, new this. And now I'm just like, how can I be there for my existing team and partners? And ever since focusing the last year, I feel like we've gone probably the best year of growth that I've had in business, uh, maybe ever. Wow. Congratulations. And not just financial growth, but organization, bringing in key people, just like fixing obvious when my head's above water and I'm not focusing on all these like streams of income, we'll call it. Um, I'm able to look at things within the business and be kind of what the fuck was I thinking moments because I can, I have more time to think about my core business businesses um, rather than just being like focused on shiny things. You know, and it just it some of my best solutions and things we've done to you know again bring in key people, make big investment decisions, things like that will sometimes be just me not doing anything on a Friday and just thinking all day, and I'll it'll hit me like, why are we doing it this way when we need to be doing it this way? Or why am I why don't we have this person doing this on our team? Or again, just thinking and investing thoughts and energy and resources and using my brain power on existing projects rather than new things, um, which again is <clears throat> it's challenging for a lot of us entrepreneurs, but it's very important. And it's a mistake I made a long time uh, for many years. You think it's there's a distinction between being able to say no to someone else and being able to say no to oneself? Um, so uh, example, maybe, like, I mean, I, like I think if Bob says, let's go do this, you're like, no. And that's not, I, I hold you in a high regard. You, my observation of you, Jeremy Adams, is you'll say no if, so that, but then if what you're saying, like this, this, this self introspection that you're articulating makes me think, well, there's no Bob, it's just you or it's just me. So is there a distinction between being able to say no to someone else versus saying no to ourselves? What do you think about that? I mean, I don't know if there's a distinction, maybe it's similar, but I would say a very successful trait is being great at saying no, in my opinion, being phenomenal saying no, saying no almost 100% of the time. I'll give a really, a story that comes to mind. Um, a friend of mine that's, you know, I, I've, I've been fortunate to surround myself with people that are older and more successful than me. Um, and I, I value that. And a uh, story that came to mind as you were saying, like saying no, um, a friend of mine that's done very, very well in business. Um, he has a, he had a many houses. One of his houses was in the Bahamas and he told me, Hey, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine for this deal. We were talking about some business opportunity. I can't remember what it was, but um, he was in the Bahamas and I'm like, Hey, just, just friendly reminder, do you want to make that intro to the friend? And it's something that would take him, you know, 20 seconds. And he's like, Jeremy, I, I told you I don't work when I'm in the Bahamas. You know, it's my personal and family time. I'm like, even if it takes 20 seconds, um, he's like, yes, no work when I'm in the Bahamas. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, that's crazy. It's just an intro. But and I'm a close friend of his. So imagine how good he is saying no to other things, you know, like, I, wow. and I just, I didn't understand that for years. This was maybe five or six years ago, but I think a year ago or so it hit me. I was like, ah, makes sense. Why? 
I get it. He he values his time that much where no business opportunity is going to interrupt with what he feels is crucial to him at his core. You know, and I think that's like another successful trade is like figuring out what's truly most important to you. And if that's family time and on a certain weekend, whatever it is, it could be focusing on a single project, focusing on family for the weekend, whatever. But in his core, he's like, this is all that matters this weekend for me is family time. I'm not going to do any work. And it's just like committed and disciplined and strict about it. And uh, we're, we're always on our technology and stuff. It's so easy. And I'm guilty of like when I'm trying to have close time with you know, romantic partners over the years or family, I'll just, oh, let me reply to this text message and stuff like that. And um, like, what an amazing ability in modern times to be able to turn that stuff off because it's hard. Hmm. What do you think the consequences are? Of not turning it off? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think they can be different for every person. Um, I think if we're honest with ourselves, though, it's if the person or situation is important enough to you, would you be able to have the discipline to do it? And I guess maybe the people aren't as important, or maybe you just have to be honest, especially as a, a young man, like I'm 32, about to be 33 now, but in my 20s, the business was more important many times I had to build success as a man and I still feel like that mostly I've started to shift a little but as a man I just feel like I have to achieve great things and it's have you read the Alison Armstrong uh content about the uh page knight prince and king it's the four stages of manhood no what are they Page, knight, prince, king. Page is up to puberty. Knight is typically up to late 20s, mid 30s, give or take. Page is just like young kid, not worth getting into that much. But knights are just like about conquering things like the uh, next beautiful woman, like adventure, like flashy, drawing attention to myself. Like all the things that you think like young men in their 20s, myself included, they just, it's so important. Like I need to show my success. And some men never grow out of that. Fortunately, I, I, I have started to grow out of that somewhat. But, and then princes, which is the phase that I've identified I'm in based on the content, is establishing roots and building. And um, there's different, then there's three sub layers to each category. So I can't remember which one I'm in of prince, but I can resonate with it. And the, the author basically has, she's been a counselor for women for a few decades and has counseled thousands of women. And she wrote this book for women about men because mm -hmm. of all the common themes she kept hearing about all their, the women complaining about their boyfriends and husbands. And she realized like, hey, like I'm hearing the same thing in these different phases of life. So she, it's really interesting, but I can, I, that was the first time it hit me. She's like Prince phase. And like, I've moved recently, right? She's like, you care about establishing roots and building a foundation and building a kingdom. And until you have that kingdom, like you're not, you know, so much ready to start a family or like she said, sometimes young men will do it for cultural pressures or if it's norm in their town or they'll, you know, their girlfriend gets pregnant or something, they'll, but like, if it's, you ask a man truly what's important to them, in their 20s it's probably not going to be like I'm, I'm ready to start a family right now it's like i'm trying to figure my shit out you know and then mm. the final stage is king which can be like late 30s to 50 and that's what she would tell all these women like if you can be patient till the king phase once the guy reaches the past the i just need to build and establish who i am and the success He's going to be the best father, the best husband, more loving, not as like into his work all the time, typically, and not always. So she would always tell him like, if you can just be patient to the king phase, it's going to be worth it. 
So um, yeah, I'm in the prince phase, which still has night tendencies for sure. And I, and another prince phase she said is they, which this you'll hear, this will make sense to you. She said they oftentimes give themselves a hard time because they're not a king yet. Mm. And I can see that because the the men that I look up to that are more successful than me, I'm like, I even shared this with you recently. I'm like, why am I not there yet? This is frustrating to me. So as she's telling me all these like traits of a prince, I'm like, it sounds like exactly me. It's fucking wild. <laughs> How important do you think it is to study you know, whether that be audiobooks, if someone's a business owner, I mean, it, it, question doesn't even have to be just a business owner, but like how important is, because you're talking about this book, if you didn't pursue knowledge, you wouldn't be talking about it. So to you, how important is that? Is yeah, I mean, it's, um, for me, I go through phases. So I haven't been reading too many audiobooks lately. I probably only read one this year, which for a while I was reading probably two a month. I've been doing more podcasts. I listen to probably 10 to 20 hours of podcasts a week. Mm. I've been down a finance journey. A lot of the podcasts are finance related topics. Um, that just feels right for me at this phase in my life. I feel I have a lot to learn, learn financially, as well as I think I could be more responsible, especially as a a future, you know, husband, hopefully one day, father one day, continuing to lead companies. I think it's in my best interest to be as fiscally responsible as possible. So I just feel called to learn as much about finance management, different investing, raising capital, just all these things I've been diving into. But yeah, it's crucial. It's There's a podcast or a book for like anything you're dealing with in your life. I mean, we're in a great time where whatever we're dealing with there's thousands of other people dealing with the exact same thing you're not very special you know you can learn from them or have dialogue or whatever any podcasts you'd recommend um i'll go through the ones right now that um you know i never listened to podcasts before which is it may be interesting to some of the listeners until recently. Um, and I actually do love them as a medium. And the reason is because of, of the books, obviously, right? You have to choose, but it's a very different experience than a book. I'd like to ask you about that too. But yeah, what are some recommendations for the listeners? Yeah. So um, Money Guy show, it's like 30 minute shows about just like different investing practices. That's more like personal finance. Um, I actually listened to a show called Breaking Points. It's like a balanced uh, political show. It's hosted by a Republican and a Democrat, and they just like talk about major points going on in a, a domestic and international politics, and they share from both sides. So it's um, fairly balanced, which I feel like I can get decent understanding of what's going on. Millennial Investing Podcast, um, History Daily, I haven't uh listen to as much of that lately but that's pretty good it's just like little snapshots of this day in history and different things all around the world we actually for our patriotic brands we because of history daily we launched a newsletter that we eventually want to turn into a possibly podcast or video content called american history daily where every day we send our subscribers like something cool that happened on this day in history um the, those are the main ones. There's a few other Professor G podcast, uh, Making Sense with Sam Harris, things like that. But there's a there's a lot I'm subscribed to, um, and it just depends on kind of the mood I'm in, you know. Why do you think there's this proliferation of podcasts? Because it's natural. I feel. Um, I feel like TikTok algorithms and stuff, although they're addictive and I'm guilty of scrolling on social media as much as anybody. But I don't think that's how humans have communicated with one another for a hundred thousand plus years. It's um, long form conversation. You know, once we had fire, 
were able to cook our food and only had to hunt a few hours a week. So I think all people did is just try to stay alive and talk. You know, that was entertainment. Interesting. Was, one was actually, it's probably in this order. One was stay safe. Two was reproduce. And three was talk and keep each other entertained for hours a day with stories. And I think that's just what we crave and what we're used to at a human level. Our great, great ancestors weren't scrolling their phones. Uh, I don't know if you know that, Jay, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm here to learn. Like think about what people did even like pre-World War I before the radio, like for entertainment. There was live shows, of course, um, plays and Broadway, but other forms of entertainment was just fucking talk and listen. Why did you commit to doing that for a year? The podcast? Yeah. Um, I think uh, it was a few things. I, uh, I've been fortunate to do a lot of traveling in the last five or six years um, to many countries. I think I've counted. It's probably like 30 countries by now or something close or maybe mid-20s I can't remember it's quite a bit though it's many really poor countries and uh we're also in a stress test right now with the U.S. like democratic republic as a system and what our values are as a country and I think there's a lot of areas for improvement but I think what we have is something very special and uh I uh I think one, I was just during one, during the time I was just getting frustrated at like how so many people had like a distaste for our country because it just, to me, feels like, like have you ever traveled anywhere? Have you ever seen anything else in the world? Because if you have, you, I think would realize that again, imperfect, but I mean, you go 30 minute flight out of Miami to Havana and it's look third world country like a fucking bomb went off you know it's like like infrastructure falling apart i was having dinner in havana uh, a few years ago and uh they were welding the building inside like 30 feet from our table um even basic stuff like that i'm like do they have code or like best practices they're probably not do construction on um, dangerous construction <laughs> on a building as on like a Friday night as customers are eating. Like that, do they consider that? Like probably not. Um, and talk wow. about emission standards when all your cars are 75 years old because of an embargo, like just walking around downtown, you're just breathing black smoke. And just like, again, that's just one example. Um, Cuba people are super nice and friendly, but um. I would say the quality of life and what we have here. So that was one was just like really exercising what I think is great, which is our first amendment, right? Which is very special to our country to just talk about whatever, especially topics people feel uncomfortable. And two, there was just, I think a lot of bottled up opinions for me personally. And I genuinely wanted to just have conversations with people that disagreed with me. I mean, I had a lot of, this was during like, started during like the George Floyd times, but I had multiple of my black friends on and we spent hours talking about racism. I mean, I, I thought that was like, if anything can be productive during those times, it's having conversation, not just people shitting on each other on social media and like, oh, you didn't make your social, you didn't do a post today with a black screen. You're a fucking racist. Like those are some crazy times if you look back at how stupid people were being. So I just felt uh, called to do something like that. Can, can you elucidate on how you have conversations with people that think so differently than you? How, you, how do you stay in a conversation with someone? How do you think do that? Can you just see if we can break it down to the most granular level 
there had to be times when you were talking to somebody and you were upset a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, well, one of the, and I mentioned earlier, one of the positive takeaways from doing the podcast was I truly don't think, I would say Americans, I can't speak for, you know, us and uh, someone in uh, North Korea, because I imagine we have massively different belief systems, but I don't think most Americans are that far off from viewpoints. For sure, slight differences. But if you just go, like every major issue, if you could go through the top 10, whatever you feel is most important to you, you know, I don't think we're that far off. And she, like, I don't think I'm like the smartest person in the world, but I think I'm reasonably intelligent. Um, so if you go back and listen to some of these episodes, I think when people would make claims, that were like just constant claims that we hear people make. And, and some of them are true and some of them aren't true. But like an example, like police are racist. Like we, we, we hear that a lot and there's some truth to it for sure. There is some truth, like there's just, unfortunately, there's just some level of the population that's gonna um, discriminate against someone's skin color or religion, or if you like, have funny teeth or you're skinny or fat I mean people are just going to discriminate we're all guilty of it um but a claim you know police are just inherently racist the police department is systemically racist just like all these claims we heard for years okay I'm, okay what evidence do you have to support that claim you know and uh I think it's hard for a lot of people uh to answer you know well, uh, I got pulled over by a cop once. One of my friends said, yeah, I've been pulled over many times over the years, a couple times, one time or two times. I can't remember exactly, maybe more. It's been a couple of years, but the cop threw me to the ground and none of my white friends have experienced anything like that. And I'm like, that's a valid point. That's, a va that's good factual support. But then there's other times where it's, um, a friend of mine would say sometimes, I walk across the street and then a white person will just cross the street when I'm walking towards them. And I was like, well, there could be a lot of variables why they're crossing the street. Like maybe, maybe it's because you're a different skin color, but also maybe it's because you're like a tall man, or maybe it's just because like they saw their friend on the other side of the street or they just happen to be going to the restaurant. And the other. Like there's a lot of variables. So I think once you're willing to ask the questions and just let see what people say, it's, um, you know, it, sometimes there's good evidence and sometimes there's not. And I think that's the area of growth for anybody is when someone shares good evidence, I think it's important to acknowledge like, okay, that's a good point. Very good feedback. That's, when that was actually some of the best evidence I've ever heard um, for like there is some level of racism in the police force minus all the stats because there's a lot of stats that um, can paint any picture you want. Like people are really smart from both sides. They can paint almost any picture. But one of my black, black friends saying, I've had this happen to me you know, two or three times where they pull me out, they actually like, you know, pointed a gun at me a couple of times. Like, have you ever had that happen to you? Like, I'm like, that's a very good point. I have not had that happen to me. That was one of the biggest things where I was like, shit. And this guy's like one of the nicest dudes I know. Like, I can't imagine a police officer doing that um, to him um, because he, yeah, he's a former military, just the nicest, most respectful dude. Um, but yeah, so that's just an example. I think asking questions, just letting people answer. And if they do give an answer that challenges your viewpoint, acknowledge it. You know, that's, that's a very good point. And my viewpoint has evolved because of it. Do you think business owners lose in business because they're not able to master that skill? 
it's shocking to me actually like how little adult conversations like um by adult conversations i'm referring to just uncomfortable important conversation so you know whatever you feel is just uncomfortable and tough to talk about for you typically it's a lot of the same things but big financial um investment decisions um personality conflict hr conflict uh just them doing a poor job you know whatever is super uncomfortable it i think the, the better we are as having those as entrepreneurs especially in today's climate of people easily getting triggered and uncomfortable and offended. And just, it's a, I actually think that's a, a superpower. Why do you in the business that you're in? And what is it for those that don't understand, you know, we haven't gotten there. They haven't listened to episode 91 of culture runners podcast, or they haven't followed Max's journey and, they don't know who I'm talking about. Yeah, so I'm in three companies, involved in three companies, primarily similar roles in each company. And there's a lot of overlap. So I know I've talked a lot about focus so far. But what I've done essentially is create a similar role for myself in each company that has a lot of overlap in the industry. So where all three of them are internet marketing, e-commerce companies. There's one where we own our own brands um, called Hero Brands, primarily in the patriotic collectible and apparel space. One where we run ads and we're an agency for many large brands um, called Unicorn Traffic. And then Unicorn Innovations is our education company where um, we train uh, business owners and marketing professionals how to more effectively advertise their business. So there's a lot of overlap in the three. And I basically work with the operators on each company from like an advice standpoint, bringing in important relationships, um, really just helping move forward the best way I can, um, trying to not get in the way too much, being helpful, but not getting in the way, which is a balance that I've been learning over the years. Uh, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Oh yeah, you said how did I get into it? Like why, why, why that sector? Um, What's so think, special about it? Like, should people be exploring? I had a million questions around that. Yeah, I, I think as entrepreneurs, um, it's like there's just a lot of industry. Like, it's a lot about timing and um just randomness so i had my manufacturing company i started when i was 22 we built food trucks right so it's like we worked with some of the biggest brands in the restaurant industry we shipped them all over the world i mean it's pretty crazy i had no clue what i was doing right but i did figure out how to market this business online and i would always tell myself if I only had to worry about this online stuff and not the manufacturing portion, because that's what I was good at. Um, and I think I just understood at a young age, like kind of like the, at, at least a basic level, the advertising component. And then uh, I invested in a lot of high ticket sales training. So I just understood kind of basic levels of consumer psychology and how to position ourselves as an authority and stuff. And then after we sold the deal, this goes back to the shiny object thing. I just didn't want to like the manufacturing and the operations portion of it was always really challenging for me and not interesting to me. So I would always try to have good partners or team members to handle that and made a lot of mistakes there too. But it was then I realized that's kind of the sector I was good at this like online marketing, like building relationships. So, um, the business just kind of evolved from there. Uh, I started doing some side consulting projects and because I knew that's what I was good at. And then we just eight years later, now I'm in um, the three companies that I mentioned. Is it still like, what is the opportunity for online marketing 
to those that don't understand it. They're either not using it for the business. They don't even grasp like what could be, maybe someone listening to this has a bricks and mortar business that they're where you were at 22, you know, and they're thinking what you were thinking. Should they take the leap and focus on the marketing side and the online ether? If I was a smart 22 year old, what I would have done was realize that admit to myself and everybody around me, I suck at fulfillment manufacturing operations and just kind of put that in one bubble. If I would have just partnered with a manufacturer and just said, hey, let's just work out a deal where I send you a bunch of business, I would have had like 1% of the headache and probably earned a lot more income um, and a lot less liability. I mean, when you're building these big trucks with um, propane tanks and generators and I mean, they're like moving bombs, you know, so very expensive insurance. I mean, there's all these like business lessons slapped me in the face. Uh, but I think that for me, is just like really narrowing in what I'm good at and then just like building teams around me and creating partnerships that um, support my skill set so we can actually have a functioning business because me as a day-to-day leader and operator um, is chaotic and it's stressful for me. I have no interest in doing that. Uh, So I can't say what a brick and mortar business should do. I don't think I'm internet marketing or e-commerce. Like at the end of the day, I'm an entrepreneur. So my goal is to continue to have div- diversify and get into all types of business over the years or as the, just like grow because it's interesting. But the core skill set of online marketing is great for almost any industry because most businesses, the last time I checked, need revenue. So uh, to have a skill set and understanding how to acquire customers online is is helpful for almost anything unless I guess you're a monopoly or a, a government. I think a lot of people miss the wave on that. No, I mean, I'm assuming you buy products online and you probably bought more online over the last five to 10 years. I would say there's harder barrier to entry now because there's a lot of smart people i can't it could have been elon musk yeah we never leave our house i mean everything's ordered i can't remember who it was but i I, i'm elon comes to mind like it could have been a decade ago but some semi-popular person if it wasn't elon said basically that it's a shame that the smartest people in the world are trying to figure out how to get you to click an ad you know because there's just a lot of money in that in advertising and um wow Uh, There's a lot of smart people in our space because you, if you are just smart and you kind of get it, you don't need to go to college. You can earn a lot of money in your twenties and thirties. Isn't it theoretically just having a grasp of psychology and general cultural nuance, meme, meme culture. For sure. Willing to get, you know, for sure. Just essentially influencing behavior towards ends and, through means that are dependent on whatever service product is through that. Cause right. Like, I mean, I'm oversimplifying, but I'm just, no, maybe I mean, bring right. this to life for the, for the audience. I think that it's always been around since the invention of capitalism, whenever that was debated, you know, a few hundred years ago, the hardest working people and the people willing to just put themselves out there and try to figure out a solution to problems always earned more. I think the difference is now you can do it with um, without kind of leaving your house from anywhere in the world. I mean, it's a great equalizer because there's people in really poor countries that would have never had some of the opportunities they have with this. Like it, it if you're transgender in prison, different purple skin color from the moon you know if you're good at running ads and 
you understand buyer psychology, you can earn a lot of money. No one cares. Is you know, part no one... of that because the industry came up so quickly as a result of technological advancement, all the people that were going to college is like, by the time they got, by the time the textbooks and the information was packaged up in a way for that next generation to get that information, there's all these, there's this massive need for the intellectual property and for the hands. So this huge tsunami of people yeah. self taught or yeah, self -taught. learned the hard way. I think like, yeah, yeah I think, help me out here. I'm trying to figure out. I think what you're getting at is they're like, there's not a college degree for this. So like, like how could there be theoretically? I don't know if there is or not. I don't, Maybe I don't, now they're starting to because it's been 10 years or whatever, but or or more or so. But like, think about it. It takes time for the institutions to commercialize, package up, and sell intellectual property. That's essentially what institutions do for a culture, is they get the next generation prepared for labor. So listening to your story, it's like. Some of the things you're saying. I mean, very, yeah, so good. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I think what you're talking about too is like basic supply and demand economics as well. Like, so not only are schools not teaching it, so it's pretty much all self taught um, or self taught, or you work with a company and kind of learn the ropes and eventually like leave or whatever. But it's just either self taught slash just kind of grinding it out and getting like on the job experience. But because there's so little skill in our space and so many businesses that want to uh, be more effective marketers on a Facebook or a TikTok, whatever. So there's, I think there's estimated 30 million small businesses in the United States. And um, I believe a majority of them now on some level have to be marketing and selling products online you know 50 percent or higher i would just speculate um obviously some not as much as others but even if you're a like a they have to react to consumer behavior yeah consumer. if you're a local flower shop if you're a local flower shop or whatever i mean you're just having to like at least do some organic social posts or like run some you know, campaigns in your zip code for valentine's day or whatever it is so it's like there's all these businesses that know they need to be on these platforms. And then there's like a super tiny pool of competent uh, individuals or teams that can help them. So, I mean, there's there's unbelievable income earning opportunities. Like what, what's in it, like what's the, for the lay person, right? Just little ego here is fun. What What kind of opportunity is it for, like what kind of money is in that for for these competent tiny groups in the thousands in the millions in the tens of millions like what do you mean by that you know is it neurosurgeon it's money more than what neurosurgeons yeah. make yeah so i would like say what does a neurosurgeon make they go to college for 12 years and then they're saving lives with brains and all that i don't know what is it when i think like the 1% really neurosurgeon yeah. i looked it up once it was like a million we never like really now with unicorn traffic, we, um, and I'm not asking you to divulge your personal information. Yeah, I'm yeah, saying no, like, I can share generally in the, in the industry. I'm curious, like what, what, you know, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now we're actually building out a really big team and, um, a really smart team and investing a lot in training and finding talent and actually turning the traffic agency into, a legitimate company, but I would say back five or six years ago, um, with we would always be, be boutique, maybe work with a handful of big brands. Um, we would typically just get these brands reaching out to us. Uh, like we've never promoted for these services, either word of mouth or they would buy. We had some education products. I mean, it wouldn't be very uncommon for us to have a hundred grand a month in retainers without trying um, with minimal cost. 
to produce that because uh, Max is a smart guy and he's really good at what he's doing. And maybe we'd have, I don't know, call it 10 or 20 grand in labor cost out of that 100, but the rest of it goes to us as owners, roughly, again, roughly. That's without really trying very hard um, to get these clients. It was just a few big ones. So just say 10 to 20 grand a month per client. Um, at, and we're in a couple guys in our mid 20s, really have no clue what we're doing, but we're good at this one thing. Um, or they thought we were good enough, uh, right? And then my high ticket sales skills come in from the food truck days. So I'm able to close these long-term deals and stuff. So yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I didn't go to college um, or anything. I just, there was a market opportunity. Mm -hmm. There still is really a shortage of talent. The ad platforms and stuff have evolved to make it a lot easier for the typical person to be successful, but there's still a giant need for talent for brands that have large budgets and more complex uh, product offerings or whatever. How do you... What do you think of like because we don't have a lot of people on the show yet that fall into this millennial category? What do you think of our generation? And Are we as bad as they say? Yeah. Do they even say we're bad? Like who's that? Is six? Yeah, yeah. That's my other question. Who's you know, what, what is success for the millennial generation? Do you, do you know doctors that hear your story, you know, that are our age that tell you like, you're, you're an asshole. I'm sorry. Excuse my French. Like, you know what I'm saying? Cause there's maybe they're still, they just got their job and they hear your story and what you've been up to. And they kind of they resent you. Like, I, I'm just curious, like, just listening to this and learn, you know, learning them. We don't have a lot of enough people in our demographic on the show. Yeah. I, what I, my opinion of like my generation and younger is it's very binary from a sense of, um, and not my gender either binary. I just, not. <laughs> but, I get uh, it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like either they fucking get it and they want to work hard or they just don't, in my opinion. It's like that, like it's black or white. And there's peers that are uh, like you're one of them, but it's just like we have big goals. We want to accomplish a lot. And, you know, I won't say who it is, but I think the polar opposite is um, there's there's a friend of mine that um, uh, we were in similar honors classes in school and uh he's uh just smart guy funny guy like if anything i'd argue he's probably like higher iq than me he's really sharp really witty um he's been really struggling financially and he has a family and uh like i couldn't imagine if i had a family and i was struggling financially i would do whatever it takes i would be working seven days a week eyes mm -hmm. open till eyes shut because I just believe as a man, like I need to deliver for my family. And I think you're the same way. We would do whatever it took. And I just think there's that mindset in our group and there's the complete opposite and there's not a lot in the middle. And, and this guy like really struggling, like, um, and it's unfortunate to see. And I'm just kind of like not able to pay bills legitimately, like items are getting repossessed. And it's just like not working. And it's like, I I don't know what, I've thought about this a lot. I'm curious your thoughts. Like, mm. is there something genetic that you think impacts that mindset? Or is that a learned thing? Is there, is there a chemical? Like, what do we think? We have a similar upbringing, like same everything growing up. Like, what's the difference? Are you asking me? Yeah, like, do you, do we think it's, hereditary like genetic like do we think it's like the food we're eating and the, sun, the amount of sunlight we're getting or the, <laughs> the, the, 
uh, the amount of the TV shows we're watching, the people we're around, a little bit of everything. I mean, what what is it that would just have you sense? asked this person what they think? I have about themselves. I have. Um, we've talked about it a lot, honestly, almost to the point where. And the reason I ask that is I think the answer is likely like the the practical answer would be subjectively represented and interpreted through them like someone that like that friend that mentor that peer the answer the the true answer i think because i don't have the answer but i think theoretically the answer would be revealed through that right because if so so meaning i don't like that's my question to you is if you bring that up to them what do they think um i mean not to dive too much in case he listens to this uh because he, he could uh but yeah, we don't have to go into it all. I mean, that's yeah, my yeah, answer. I think that that's my answer to your question is I would ask that person what they think about your analysis and maybe we've they all have it, we've talked maybe they about haven't it even for years. About it. Yeah, I've known him for almost 20 years. We've talked about it for almost to the point where I I just can't bring it up anymore and just cuz I um I've tried everything under the sun. I've tried to be very really curious. I, if I had to guess, I would actually say it's more like, um, I think the natural human state is to try to conserve energy, right? And for us to, not I think, we know, like, you know, that's, we, we, Winston Churchill, said never stand up when you can sit down never sit down when you can lie down <laughs> like it's just in our best interest for survival to conserve energy and i think um especially when we don't have a lot of true hardships in first world countries like ourselves there's not a lot to motivate the typical person i think we feel called and we're just working on businesses and doing these things but I would guess it's just more of a natural thing. It's just like there's nothing that's very inspiring. And even like our welfare systems and our poorest people still compared to a lot of poor areas in the Keep world. Keep something live. in mind. If I'm not leading myself, someone's leading me. So if someone I care about is in my mind lacking leadership you know are they would they follow me kind of thing I, you know, I would, so sometimes in our in our life you know like that's another way to look at it like I, you meet people it's like it's so clear that they lack like kind of like you are outlined something or someone to believe in and if it's not through themselves then the something is irrelevant because they're not going to go through whatever hardship but it, then it's someone so like there's there could be a void so let's say someone works for a company even you could be unbelievably responsible and effective and competent all these things because the best companies in the world are built on the shoulders and the, and the knees and the backs of astounding people that work tirelessly for and with whomever's in control of that so uh, so so and then on the other side of it you could have someone that is the owner, you know, ultimately in control, and they may be in a season where they they don't feel in control. Um, so, so on either side, it's like we either are the leader in that season or we lack a leader. So it's something to think about. Is is a part? I don't that all. It, I thought about all that from the question. It's a, it's a, it's a deep deep question. It's and it, our, our, if I'm if I'm honest about out loud about it. You know, I, I, I've been trying to answer that a long time for myself. I, I um, think so. It's a great think, question. Yeah. Our older generations, the pre boomers, whatever, what are the pre boomers called? The ones born during. Is it X or no? That's after. Yeah. That's um, after. It's like nothing. The lost? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it's, it's funny because I have no idea. And then just start let me, saying. Let me let me look this up. Hold on. Generation before boomers. Silent. 
silent, but then there's something, okay, the greatest, following the greatest generation, the silent generation. Okay, interesting. I feel like there's another name for it, but anyway, I think this greatest generation, World War II, and then this, the World War One, and then the silent generation, World War II, like the types of lives they lived compared to us. I just think it's 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 really hard to compare. You're sacrificing everything uh, to fight for your country. You're um, you're not as certain when you're going to get your next meal. Uh, our financial system legitimately fucking collapsed overnight. You don't. We don't even know the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, diseases uh, are much more prevalent. Uh, I mean, it's just like truly tougher times. And I think uh, probably the boomers and uh, younger boomers all the way to Gen Z or whatever the little babies are now, I don't even know. But like what true hardships compared to our generation? Like, I, I feel like we humans need some true hardships. And I think that we mm. as entrepreneurs, although it's nothing compared to our ancestors fighting in war, literally leaving your wife and kids to fight in war and the wives are contributing by like building uh, things. And like, I mean, it was such a crazy time compared to like us, like our challenges in business probably compared to most people, our hardships nowadays, but compared to our ancestors is nothing, you know? And I think the fact that we actually have some hardship is good for us because I think we need it as humans. Like humans have always had hardship. Like we're always having to hunt and gather and defend ourselves from bigger animals and um, mm. be careful of not like sneaking up on other tribes and like we never had like what we could yeah that's an interesting well what do you think about this the bot bo in this overly maybe an overly simplistic way but there's a dichotomy of hardship there's the external hardship so something happens you know you're in a car accident as a young kid and you lose a parent you know it's external an internal hardship would be you're six you're walking down the street and a kid calls you a name and yeah. it hurts. So, or maybe that's not even, or no, yeah, no, you see something. No, no, let me use a different one that I think is a little bit better for that. You, you, you're you a kid and you you just see your parents arguing and you take it personally. If internal hardship, like what I'm trying to make is there's like these external things like war and then there's internal, like the, the, the Sunday cone that you wanted, you didn't get. And it's like, my question to you is, what do you think happens to a culture when there's less war, there's less car, you know, acts, like there's less external conflict, but there's still that interpersonal, internal conflict. You think that we become more, it's like we become more, we lose the opportunity to, to have to react to the external and deal with it. So we don't, we lose the opportunity for our values to manifest. We just have that internal conflict, which is like entitlement and resentment and fear. Like, what do you thought? What do you think about that? Is, Cause I think that's what you're trying to say in a sense. Well, that it's not as hard these days in a lot of ways, but I'm going to say we still have that internal emotional conflict. We take everything so seriously. Right. So like something that's big for you is not big for me. Something that's big for me is not big for you. So what do, what do you think? I would agree with that. I mean, we can't, I can't say what's important and what's a hardship to you, but we have the freedom and safety and security to have these mental hardships for the one of the first time. So that's what I kind of mean about that external hardship. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so that into that category. How, think even the word, less of those? Sorry. Yeah. Even the word hardship is subjective because maybe people fighting in World War One in the United States were like, man, could you imagine in the Civil War, we were fighting our own people, at least we're not doing that. Like, and then like the people in the Civil War looking back at the Revolutionary War, like, <laughs> I, like I, 
I guess it's all just subjective <laughs> based on your um uh a guy a friend of mine that's was kind of a mentor over the years, very successful businessman. He said, I assume every day there's gonna be 10 problems. So if there's only four, it's a great day. <laughs> like mm. but if you assume there's gonna be zero every day and there's two, it's a shitty day. So it's like all Do you think like, that well, your original question kind of actually, meaning the original question about your friend actually is exemplified through the political dichotomy, like that yin and yang? Because essentially this scenario we're in where you're talking about your friend, it's like, what? what is it? Is it environment? Is it genes? Is it me? What can I do? I've tried everything to help them doesn't seem like he can be helped well then so yeah we need social programs see see what i'm saying like it becomes this political conversation in a sense like maybe that's just how the cookie crumbles like if that person's not able to lead themselves and they won't go with me right my narrative is not compelling enough i'm they're not gonna like your best friend over here he won't work for, and i have one too i can think of that i would love for them to work for me they don't want to work for me I'm their friend. Work They'd rather envy they and resent them. and still like me every once in a while that I'm doing so well. I would love for them to work for me. I'll lead them, but they're not going to do that. Now, if I'm not their leader, maybe they have no one in their life to follow. Therefore, they're behind on everything and they're failing, whatever. Nothing I can do to save them. I'm not, I'm not omni omniscient. So there you go. That's why we need social programs. Yeah, I'm just saying like, it's like, <laughs> meaning, I don't know what your thoughts on that. It's like. Yeah, it's there's two, the the like, I would say like the classic conservative and classic liberal argument, just to be clear, because I don't know what like either party really stands for nowadays. It's just like really mixed. Um because the Democratic Party in the 90s was the one tough on crime, and now the conservatives are the one tough on crime. Like, they just shift. So I don't even know, like, it's, it's someone listens to this 30 years from now, like, the Democratic Party could be of low taxes. I don't fucking know. JFK lowered taxes in the 60s as a Democrat. Like, so, but the classic conservative argument, and there's truth to both. It's like, if there is the safety net, you're ultimately... Like if someone knows there's a safety net, there's going to be that percentage of people that just fall into the safety net. If there's not the safety net, there's going to be a chunk of those people that actually will be motivated. And then there probably will be a chunk that just still don't give a shit and will just live on the streets, right? But um, that's why I think with everything, it's like within moderation is important. Like I think like unemployment program is a good example. I think you can claim unemployment for up to a year after you're laid off or fired. So it's like, um, you could even argue that's a long time, but at least there's a time limit on it. So it's like, you have a year to go find another job. It takes time. You want to find something that's good pay. You can drive to, that's a good fit for you. So it's like a year timeline. That's a good example of a, a social program that I think does both it creates a little bit of a safety net but it's not a permanent safety net it helps through a transition so that's something i'm for um uh like just general basic social programs yeah of course i mean we can maybe talk about different ones but um i guess it just depends on what your goal is as a society if it's to have um is less because the homeless population continues to grow too and we actually have a lot of social programs for that and it's a very complicated issue a friend of mine actually is heavy in the homeless space and one of the reasons why homeless issues is so complicated is because whether it's private or publicly funded these housing systems have rules so like many homeless people believe it or not not all, of course, not all. I don't want to get taken out of context, but many, I know, they choose to be homeless because in homeless yes. systems, you can't shoot heroin. Like, you can't, like, you have rules to abide by. And there's a chunk of those people that are like, I don't want to live with these rules. I want to live on yeah, the street. You, it's why I was, like, starting to laugh. So I'm thinking, like, how dare we assume 
I'm walking down the street and I see someone, I'm not thinking, I catch myself, I say, hold on, like I have to catch myself, homeless, I don't know this person. It's like, a, it's like almost being like racist or ageist or bias or sexist. I'm just assuming they're homeless just because I'm partaking in the economic system and they are not. I introduce myself, say, hey, I'm Jay. What's your name? Now, do I do that every single time? I, no, no, no. Like, obviously, I, I'm conserving energy. I might just walk by and smile or something. But what I'm, my point in that is, like, who says they're homeless? They are, like, culture. Now, literally, we, we could infer that. My, my point I'm trying to make is, I, I don't know what that person's doing. Maybe they're, 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 I'm the one that's homeless. They're exactly where they want to be. They're doing exactly what they want to do. Yeah, we can debate who has the better system, like, especially if you're homeless and I know like Hawaii has a big homeless population, you know, like if I was going to be homeless, that's a great place to go live on the beach like you don't have bills, you don't have financial obligations, you're not worried about, you know, your credit score, um, like, you're not worried about shifts in the marketplace to keep your business uh healthy. What, like, what I, I want to be clear because I, I, I could be misunderstood. Like I, I'm trying to make an argument for empathy and inquiry and compassion with people that we could so easily label as implicitly less than whatever we've got going on. You know, here we are, you and I with shelter, having this life's life philosophical pursuing these big answers, just, you know, just as much as someone that may not have shelter has either had these thoughts or is capable of having these thoughts, uh, you know, it, 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 philosophically, and at some level where anyone listening to this, it could be just as homeless as someone that, but I'm just, that's where I'm more, I'm going. I'm not trying to, I don't want it to come across that I'm um, condescending people that lack shelter or that I'm against any type of social engagement or interaction. I just think we, 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 when I say we, I mean culture and I mean us as individuals without thinking, we might be projecting a lot. It's like we walk down the street and we feel so guilty about the lies we tell ourselves, the things we avoid in our, in our interpersonal relationships. We're so unclear in what we want out of life. And we walk by someone that seems like they got it worse than us and we pity them or we mock them or we throw money at their face, but we don't even meet them. We just call them homeless. It's like, maybe you're home. Maybe I'm homeless. What does that even mean? So that's a touchy subject for me philosophically. I think about it all the time. Uh, not, not every day, like all day, but I've written about it and I, and I, that's the, I don't know. That's just we all an interesting. I would love your feet, thoughts or feedback on what. Yeah, what we all can assume that they didn't make that decision for themselves. You know, like, and I guess like what's interesting too, because I maybe six months ago or so, I spent twenty or thirty minutes looking up homeless stats, and I remember, I think it's like three or four million homeless in the United States estimated, and that's one percent of the country. So it's three or four million people. But if you would have like asked our founding fathers if 99 percent of our population is going to have shelter you know food we obviously have an uh, obesity problem so lack of nutrition maybe but not lack of calories um i would say that's a successful society of course we want to continue to help this one percent but i think at 99 percent success rate because there's just so many variables in that 1%. There's the people that choose, people going through tough times, people that are um, having drug issues, people, mental issues. I mean, there's a lot of complicated reasons on why this 1% is homeless. Um, yeah, like what do we even mean by homeless? Maybe what we're what we're saying is deeper, and I, I'm going to try to contradict everything I said. 
they're cultureless, right? Like what is home? It's a physical place where people that you have your past and present and potentially future, like your blood, your, your culture, your community, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, kids, brothers, sisters, like home, you know, that base for your family, your friends, your people to come to. If someone doesn't, I mean, our whole system is based on the opportunity for an individual to have the right to property, for example. It's like pretty big deal in this. That's kind of a scam though, because yeah, I think it's a scam almost because the typical homeless person probably has a higher net worth than the average American our age because it's zero, not negative, (laughs) you know? Um, (laughs) They're not, you know, maybe some of them are in school debt or something. I don't know, but uh, like, I, I think it's definitely a bit of a scam to just like this American dream of owning a house, all oh, housing's too expensive. Like whoever said that the purpose of a country is to give everybody their own fucking four bedroom house and make it affordable on a, a working income where you have no skills. Like, why is that the country's responsibility? Like, if the housing's too expensive, there's still so many areas in the country where housing is much more affordable. Mm. Obviously, you're not in Miami or New York or super desirable areas, but even northern parts of Florida, I mean, there's still housing that's like affordable, but it's just not desirable. Well, what level of responsibility do you think people listening to this, citizens of a culture, have to have of what they choose to do with their credit, with their money with their with learning how to use it like how how aggressive are you on the the the, the need of resp- of the responsibility of the citizen yeah i mean there's when i was uh, an intern at an investment firm when i was 20 the guy i worked for had um he worked with a lot of teachers and uh the amount of teachers that retired millionaires and granted millionaires not what it used to mean in the 50s or the 70s but i would say millionaire is upper middle class now if you retire millionaire you're you know not flying private everywhere but you're going to be able to enjoy the rest of your life um for the most part like and i don't think they ever earned over 100k combined in a year or you know they were just normal like wage earners like household of 80k between the husband and wife and they just lived below their means they invested they uh paid off their house um they're just not idiots you know Mm. so there's people that earn two million and spend three so it's (laughs) americans have a big problem and this is what i think travel like we really care about having big cars um more than any culture that i've seen like like flashy cars are popular in a lot of cultures but young men care about these like eighty thousand dollar trucks and stuff and they're like and i even did it back in the day i had my tesla model x it was (laughs) uh, almost the same as my rent or like the same i think i think it was it was yeah i remember that actually probably yeah it's probably two thousand a month uh for the car and do you like, re- re- sorry, go ahead. Do I regret? I think it's just like we're talking about the night, the phases of men. I the think night, a lot of yeah. young men have to go through it. I'm I'm grateful I'm out of that phase now because if I would have been like investing that money, um 24 grand a year. Um well, let's I'm gonna pull it up on the interest yeah. calculator. Let's do it. Why not? Let's make this what's deca Jamie? I don't have a Jamie, it's just me. Let's just call it because I would have had some expense if it was like a A to B car, but let's just call it 18 grand a year. Over it, you ever use one of those compound interest calculators? At least two times a month, Jay. Anybody listening to this can go to investor.gov and, and what you do is you type in step one, your initial investment. So if I put 18,000 and then the monthly contribution, which would be what 1500 a month 
for 18 grand a year. And then how many years are we going to put in this thing? Well, 40? maybe a better thing to do would be like, maybe just say 50 grand or let's just say a hundred grand of where I just spent on stupid cars in my twenties that I All right, So I'm going to put the hundred you're saying, let's just no put a hundred grand, no additional contribution. Okay. And for how long? On, check in on it um, in 20 Four. years at a 10% rate of return. Why can't we do 40? We can do 40. Well, I'm just curious what you, what, what you made 20. What was this? Is 20 years significant from you or are you? Well, you, I, um, if my goal of retirement age is in my mid forties. Okay. So let's do 20 years. But if you want to do 40, it's obviously going to like be dramatic. Out. We could talk about that too. All right, let's do both. How about that? Okay. The 20 years at 10% is, and then maybe you could tell the audience why this matters. Um, 672740 basically $672,750. That's if I didn't, the important thing to emphasize 20 there, years. that's if I didn't add one other penny. I just decided to put that in an account and like, forget about it. Like, obviously we. Yes, it would, it would go up 700, 672% doing nothing. And then it's four and a half million which at, is 45 at like times retirement age in your sixties, early to mid 60s. So the hundred grand turns into 4.5 million, but in that account, never touch it. And as your point, you're saying that you're making all this money. Most people dream of, or go to become a neuroscientist or whatever doctor. And you bought a Tesla and you, you, you would say if that same money was put into Vanguard, I'm just, you know, whatever, and never looked at again. It adds up. Is that, is that the theme? That's the theme. And why I want to do that is the more wealth I'm able to build, the more freedom it ultimately gives me to then like make better choices and be involved in the right deals I want to be in and turn down asshole clients and not work on projects. I don't, for me, that's important to me. The more wealth I'm able to accumulate, the more freedom and options and choices I have. And, and down the road, I can, uh, and there's arguments, yeah, you should enjoy life, blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean, if you really need a super expensive car to enjoy life, and that's so important to you, I, I guess I support that for you. But I think you can really enjoy life um, with a car that's, you know, 40 grand instead of 150 grand. Um, but not saying you should have an unsafe or uh, <laughs> car that can't get you from A to B. I'm not for like getting a thousand dollar car, but just something modest. Have you noticed that a lot of the people that that have done very well are like what percentage are learning this lesson and what percentage aren't like? Well, I think it's like the compound power. Like it, let's just say I would wait till I'm like just focus on building up my income, investing, learning skills. Even if I, we could map it out and say, hey, out of that 100 grand, put a 50 in the market and invest 50 in myself in masterminds or education or Harvard Business School, I actually think is 100 grand. So, you know, whatever yeah. that investment looks like to you, it could be in the mutual funds, it could be in yourself or a mix. But, um, just a little bit of delayed gratification there. We only said 20 years. I mean, at that point, you can buy, I could buy a Tesla cash um, or at a minimum that interest or that dollar sum cash flows the payment with the interest plus some. Uh, plus I'm able to borrow against it. You know, again, have more freedom and choices. So yeah, I, I heard a stat the other day, actually, it says like a, when you're college age compared to your retirement age, when every dollar you spend is the equivalent of um, around $80 at retirement because of oh, interesting. that $5 you spent on a beer in college is uh, $400 at retirement age. And granted, that's not accounting for inflation and stuff. I get it. 400 is not going to be worth the same, but still just puts into perspective like Warren Buffett wasn't a billionaire until he was in his fifties. 
and he's just had a lot of time for his shit to compound and he's made some really smart decisions combined with it of course but he would even agree i think that he just has a lot of time you know he started investing as a teenager yep right really smart investments he's obviously brilliant do you find that business people generally that you because you interact with a lot of business people and have in the past different events and groups and paid unpaid all that like what's the average business person's financial iq typically pretty high i mean um again i've just been trying to what what i'm doing in my head and where i feel like a lot of our age entrepreneurs make the mistake again is of course I want to sell many companies and build these big businesses. I want to do all those things. And I'm very confident I will have success in those areas. But I also want to like know that there's like things that happen in the market that are out of my control and something could happen with my industry or like who fucking knows. So I'm like taking both paths. I want to mm. like have these big wins and cash out and sell one of our businesses for a lot of money one day. I think it's very possible, very likely. But the other path is if I'm investing like crazy, that's a guaranteed way to earn wealth. Time in the market will either the country is going to collapse or you're going to get a return on that money. Um, if the country collapsed, our dollar would be useless anyway. So that's a guaranteed way to at a minimum take care of your family and retire wealthy and uh, not have to live paycheck to paycheck. If what are some ways that people listening uh, that you've learned in yourself learning what you're doing that they can start, they can do, they can start putting away for the future? I mean, I, I have a lot of different things I put money into, but uh, like what would you recommend? If someone agrees with this mindset, they want to sell their Porsche now, right? They have yeah, a Porsche 911. You know, they're like, I don't oh, think dude, I should listen to Jeremy. Let me let me get into some of these investments. And they're not buying FTX, are they? <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, I would only buy a Tesla priced car if I was worth like, I mean, it's hard to say what my net, net worth is now because businesses, they could be worth nothing or they could be worth a lot depending on someone to be willing to pay for it. But I would need like probably close to eight figures in investable assets before I would spend that type of money on a car. Because like I was spending, the car was 130 grand or whatever, something in that range. 120 140 i think it was 130 plus insurance i mean like that was pretty close to like what i was earning in a year you know like that's really fiscally fucking stupid uh your your car is worth almost what your annual income is like again if you have a bunch of assets that are producing income that's different but i'm a young guy and i haven't i didn't really build much assets i was investing a little uh so i mean it was um yeah it's just it, it's just dumb so yeah i invest a lot in retirement advantage accounts we talked about that like uh, through one of my companies i have a 401k and then through my own company i have a set a self-employed retirement so it's like retirement savings and then i invest in traditional stuff as well i invest in whole life which is controversial and I invest in crypto. Not too much, though. Only a, a small amount. So a little bit of everything. You think people have misconceptions of what it really takes to build a business and produce a life from a business? Um, and that goes for people that are in business, as well as maybe they're, they want to have a business, but they have a job, whether it's high paying or not. What do you think? Do you think people have misconceptions around what it really takes to build wealth, to build success as someone that's been doing it since their early twenties on your own. Basically. Yeah. I mean, in most cases, especially if you don't start with like wealthy parents or something like that, which 
of course it's still hard work but it's not nearly as much hard work when you have don't have basic financial knowledge and connections and um i mean it's it's really hard work so that's why like in most millionaires i think a vast majority like are self-made right like the stats are staggering because we've learned that many wealthy offspring don't have that same drive that like someone like I would have, you know? So it's like, a, it's a, it's a weird enough. It's a blessing to be born with minimal means because you're more likely to have the drive because you, you want something different for, um, but there's a lot of weird stats on like generations, like after the third or fourth generation, a lot of times families lose their wealth. It's pretty wild, but yeah, I, I think that uh, we're just like a little bit crazy and we just, uh, it's a, it's a long grind to get there. I mean, it's, uh, and it's a long grind to build a business that can actually last for five or 10 or longer years. I mean, there's in the online world, there's like these like short spurts of money and market trends and stuff, but it's like, I'm hoping all of my companies now, unless we exit, they're still around in 10 years. That's where mine shifted a little bit. My mindset is like, I'm thinking 10 years down the road, just as much now, I don't want to say more, but just as much as what I'm thinking, like I'm going to earn this year. When in the past, I was thinking like, what's my income going to be this month? Mm. You know? And how has that helped to think out in your view? definitely keeps you more motivated there's more impact because you're able when you're thinking long term you're able to i think attract talent that way you're able to create better jobs that way um people are going to buy into a mission they're going to want to be a part of something with a future there's a lot of benefits um, Those are, yeah i agree that's powerful jeremy this was awesome i uh didn't expect to get into some of the topics we did. As always, it's so much fun. We're gonna to have to have you back this year. I'm doing a heck of a lot more podcasts this year. I hope to have the opportunity to be openly outspoken with you again this year. Uh, everyone listening to this, check out episode nine, uh, 91 of the Coach Warner's podcast. Completely different conversation between Jeremy Adams and myself. Final thought for our audience, if you were to articulate a theme you think for this episode and a call to action or something that you want to say to, to wrap it up. A theme for the episode. Hmm, that's a tough one. Maybe just uh, when having a conversation with anybody, keeping an open mind to where that conversation can go. I mean, I think that's why we've always got along really well is because our conversations do lead to random places. And it's not as surface as we probably run into on a day to day. Mm. So uh, yeah, just keep an open mind and go deep instead of horizontal. You know, like that's probably something I've actually been thinking about this year. Like maybe I should do a better job of getting closer with my existing friends than trying to find more friends. I feel like that's more meaningful. Maybe not. I could prove myself wrong there, but my gut tells me a close five friends is better than a kind of close 17 friends or whatever. Mm. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to this episode of the Culture Runners Podcast. Thank you, Jeremy. And we will see you all next time on the Culture Matters Podcast.